It's due Wednesday. I'm going to give you one more day. So it's due today. Turn it in. It's due Thursday. <laughs> it's due Thursday. And um, so I'll give you one more day, but I do have a few other things to add. You have to read all the rest of America to page 1,680. Let's make that do at the end of the period. <laughs> Or how about pages uh, 167 and 177? That's all better now. It's, it's amazing how 10 pages are really good after you're given a 1,000 page assignment. Well, I accidentally assigned that. I, some of you did it. I am not. Yeah, so if you got it done, you got it done. I will not quiz you on this part because of the kind of confusion when I screwed up with the sub You still have to know that. And would you like to do a map? No. You have to draw a freehand map. Yes. Of colonial America, one inch has to equal one inch, so it get a lot of paper. <laughs> <laughs> on the back of of that packet, on the back of the packet, there is a map of the Revolutionary War. It's pretty basic. Uh, my guess is you would get a lot of it on your own, and that's doing the rest. I know to get everything in there, I had to use a full map, but most of the battles are going to be like. Right there and right here, that they're packed them in, but that will be due on Friday. Sound good? And you know, if I put it back so we can carefully rip it off, see, thinking ahead. Aren't you impressed? Yeah, 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 I can tell that was sincere. All right, and another thing next week, we'll have our first test, first regular unit test, probably next week. And we've got independence, so it's basically through everything we've done through the deck or through uh, through the end of the war. And I will give you a list probably tomorrow of things you need to know to make sure you get it. But that will be, or uh, there will be multiple choice and some short ID essays. And for this first one, I'll give you a hint what the essays will be. And as the year goes by, I'll give you a hint. Then the hints will get worse and worse, so no more hints. But then again, it gets easier, too. You get used to what you have. Yeah. Uh, what that test? I'm, I'm hoping for Thursday. But I leave it up in the air. You never know. And if everything goes right, my plan is do the test on Thursday. And then we'll have to start something on Friday, but also maybe bring in a musket. I have to send a note home because I, you know, I think you understand why. But a Revolutionary War era musket, and talk a little bit about that. That's kind of a fun little day if we have enough time and all that. Yeah, I think soccer. We'll figure it out. I know. I'm. If soccer's gone, we'll just have to. Can we get notes on that? Notes. Notes. Notes for what? Oh, you can use your notes right for the moment you take the test. Okay. Yeah, sound good? Yeah. No, so this will be, you have to study, you have to know it, yeah. And don't think, okay, I'll get this list. Let's go look in the textbook and jot down a little bit of trivia for each thing. Well, then you will not do well. Especially for parts I talk a lot about in class. That's what I'm looking for. And that's really not in the textbook or we get this kind of, as you've been reading, you probably know it's like little bits are in there, a lot of it, most of it isn't. And so, Make sure that you not only are writing things down in class, but in your own words, but please go back through and review it. Don't try to do, uh, go back and look at things you wrote a week and a half ago and look at the night before the test or worse, like that morning, maybe at lunch. Oh, quick look at you will not do well. And the thing is, go spend just a couple minutes, look at it, and so it refreshes it. And so when you go back again to study, you know what you wrote. Because when you write things in class, we all do this right really quick. Sometimes you just don't really know, and so you can go back through and kind of reinforce what you remember. And and this uh, and for the multiple choice, you know, I try to make them real. You know, I, as the year goes by, I make them a little bit harder, but still, they're going to be pretty hard questions. And you have to know more than just. A basic little bit of trivia. Make sure you connect it to other things. Try to get some kind of linkage. Even if you don't remember one thing, if you remember something next to it, the memory will pop out. Okay, so where are we finishing? We're behind here, so we got to go fast. So what happened was 
We had um, colonial economies. So they would, if you were sitting there in England and you were going to go to the new colony, which section would you go to? Probably. And why the north? And more opportunities, more diversification, more cultural, more economic chances. And yeah, people will go to the south. But yes, they wanted land. And That's why they're probably an assassin. Yeah, you know that map, it's never been a very good map. That those cost about eighteen hundred dollars. A gouge. Of these maps too, but isn't mine on the board. But anyways. So Massachusetts, what group of people started Massachusetts colony? What religious group? And what we call this? How about here? 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 Tidewater. And, and I said that this Tidewater area was what kind of kingdom? Yeah, just basically a slave kingdom. And so with that, and uh, went through the different types of colonies, went through all the more diversified economy. Now remember, it's still the big thing is land. There's no real money there, it's land. And everybody wants land. And they're pushing westward for more land. But who's coming this way for more land? But one thing about this, there's only gonna be about one tenth the number of French colonists as English colonists. And therefore, their economy won't be as diversified. In fact, mostly fur trade. Now, let's say the tribes that are squashed between, like the Huron or the, the Mohawk or the Choctaw, or not Choctaw, I'm sorry, um, the Iroquois, right here. I mean, they kind of have to pick sides. Would they have better relations with the English colonists or the French colonists? Yeah, just not as many. They're not going to take as much land. <coughs> You know, they have to do a really terrible calculus. There seems to be a lot of those people coming. What side will it, will it be more? Who will be the biggest threat? And the other problem with the various tribes is they're fighting each other all the time. But they're moving this way, they're moving this way, and we're coming to a very important term that I got to erase when I forgot to erase last period. This Thirst for land, remember it's related to economics, and land will be, will trigger a series, a massive series of wars for empire, or empire. Words for empire. So, wars for. Let's write this again. So, wars for empire. And the search for empire is going to be called imperialism. A term you've heard before. This comes from ancient Rome. Imperialism. And. Am I just hearing things? Did someone hear something strange on the hall? Am I losing it? No, somebody's talking. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that right in front of Mr. Mahela's just going. I mean, that took a double bounce. <laughs> wow. Okay, I mean, this is. Are you going to leave it there? Huh? Leave what there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now you're getting it. Now you're getting it. Okay, so imperialism, but this is the search for empire. And the whole thing about this is getting empire, imperialism. Oh, I just filmed that too. So well. that was a lot. <laughs> you should have seen that throw. Okay. It's empire. <laughs> 
for profit. <laughs> I mean, that, remember, this is all why they got the empire. This was the economy that were profiting them more than what they really wanted to. But what was that economic policy where they wanted to suck all the gold out? Someone said, yeah, mercantilism. They were sucking the gold out. Well, it didn't quite work the way they thought. But now profit is not just money. It could just be, look at our empire. It's bigger than your empire. You know, profit could be prestige. The U.S. was is still an imperial power. The United States conquered the land you're sitting on, made it a colony, called, we call them territories, and then eventually it annexed it into the United States and became relatively equal well, parts of the U.S. A state. But the U.S. still has colonies that it conquered and controlled. You might know one? Puerto Rico. That Puerto Rico is one. And Puerto Ricans are, are U.S. citizens. But, and that was by law. So they are U.S. citizens, but since they live on Puerto Rico, they can't vote for things like, well, technically no one votes for president, but for elected office and those kind of things in the United States. It's a little bit like that whole taxation without, without representation argument. They'd be outnumbered, but at the same time, they don't really have the control. It's you know, letting somebody else decide your fate. And like, have you ever heard of Guam, the island of Guam? That's an American colony. Wait, why aren't they going to vote? Because they're a territory. So they don't. And the president, um, they don't have members of the House or the Senate. And presidents are not chosen by voters, they're chosen by electors. And only states have electors. But so they, they were talking about making him state for a while? Yeah, and there's still talk about that. In fact, uh, I mean, they're American citizens. Either they should be they should be allowed to decide their own fate or become a state or become independent. Like they're now in this weird limbo we call a commonwealth. It's pretty tough there. I mean, I think that'd be your second class citizens in a country that are technically citizens. <coughs> and like the Philippines was an American colony. And the Hawaiian Islands was an island chain of the Americans conquered, then eventually turned into territory and state. But, so the U.S. is an imperial power, too. That's what the British were. That's what the French were. These fight for empire. And so, there's a couple different types of empire we need to know. A couple different types of imperialism. And all of them happen. The first one is what the Americans, were, or what the British were doing in the Americas. Colonial imperialism. Where you literally conquer a land, put your flag up, English government here, this is an English colony, imperialism. So this can be also really expensive. And in the Americas, the reason why Europeans, to the according to the United States, the English were able to colonize and stay was what, what allowed them more than any other thing to defeat the people who lived here. Yeah, though no, all that disease. It didn't happen in Africa, so eventually after the Europeans looted and pillaged, they were forced out. Now that's what the American colonies were. But it's more complex than this. This is what happened along the frontier, but also the United States has done the other two types of imperialism. Economic, and it goes hand in hand with cultural imperialism. Literally, the more dominant nation will take over the economy or kind of culturally change neighboring peoples or neighboring countries. I mean, you really see with the United States now, it is such a large, economically powerful, with such a with a dominant culture that neighbors really are affected by it. You go to Latin America, you see that. You go to other smaller countries, or all the way down, like for example, in you know Ecuador, they use uh, American dollars, and so that gives you an idea the way that works. But take this over. Now, it's not necessarily plant your flag and stay your own, but like American owned or British owned or whatever might be business comes in and dominates. Or cultural things about the way they live or entertainment begins dominated by the bigger country. And that's one thing you see with American entertainment today. And I'll, I'll explain the term where America comes from later. I'll later. Later. But all this as an example, and I'm going to have to change this just a little bit, but it comes from our world right here, the fur trade. The fur trade gives you a really good example of how this works in the colonies. Because this is what happened along the frontier, and it would lead to colonial and colonial conquest, colonial imperialism. The fur trade. Now, before we get to that, what fur, what animal did the European <coughs> Someone said, 
Why? <laughs> yeah. Get wet. You ever see a wet? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, two different dots for a really kind of thick barb. <laughs> get wet. Okay. <laughs> what do you do with them? Wash them. They scrape off the kind of it's really bristly fur and it's like a felt that's waterproof. Perfect for hats. In fact, that would be the rage. Be beaver felt hats into the 1840s. And then a few of them as a coat, it's a relatively waterproof, heavy, but waterproof coat. At a time, you know, pre-vulcanized rubber, you know, that's a big deal. But of course we're gonna kill all the beaver. And that's what they wanted. So along the frontier, they're trading for beaver. But let's go back to the way this worked. For the fur trade, when the colonies were new, they needed everything. They needed food, they needed help for shelter, they needed whether it be fur or other types of uh, anything for clothing, they needed everything. So at first the trade was relatively equal. But pretty soon as years go by, think about Massachusetts, by the 1650s, they're making it here. They're growing enough food basically to survive. So what's the only thing they want from the tribes here? And that's how cultural or economic imperialism, I'm sorry, cultural economic imperialism, yeah, that's how that works. For the fur trade, colonists would eventually only trade for fur. That's all they wanted. And think about the tribe right on the edge of the frontier. That's where you really notice it. So, you know, this is 1660. It's going to be right here along the Connecticut River, which I guess was just unbelievable how abundant the, the beaver were. So it's right on the frontier. But think about this process I'm going to tell you we moving to the west this whole time. And then the plains will take big steps because uh, the population is so much more spread out because it doesn't rain much. Think about the tribes, though. Over 90% died of disease. They were almost all agricultural. Pretty difficult to run you know, to farm where so many people die. Difficult to do almost anything. So a lot of their old ways are dying. And yes, they still live in permanent villages, but that really doesn't work anymore because now they have to move around to find food. Wow. Kill a little beaver, you get everything you want. You know, it's hard to farm. Kill three beaver, or I'm sorry, kill a beaver, trade the pelt for a bushel of maize. A lot easier, isn't it? Especially when the beaver are everywhere. How do you transport water at that time? How did they transport water? There's basically two ways. Stomachs. Down an animal, you cut out, use the stomach of the canteen. You do what you gotta do. <laughs> or secondly, these the tribes along, especially here with all the just you know, thick forest, they know how to make a watertight basket by weaving bark. Kind of a triple weave. Can you imagine how complex and difficult a seal that would be? So women would pass that on to their daughters, would pass it on. This is an age-old skill. That's incredibly difficult. But you have a bigger village, you can have someone doing food, you do the baskets. Would it be easier to kill five beavers in an iron pot? Has anyone ever learned to try to become good at shooting a compound bow? Right? Practice it? It's easy, isn't it? It's a meter. One time you got it right. Now imagine doing that, but first make it from scratch. How difficult it is. Oh, sure, you can do it, but it's a lot more practice. Wouldn't it be easier to kill a man beaver and trade it for a musket? Now, muskets aren't very accurate then, but they're a lot easier if you find the gunpowder. And that's what happened. All of their old ways, they abandoned. That's what we got to get. They would only trade for fur, and the tribes along the frontier, so the frontier tribes, abandoned their skills. Both economically and culturally. And think about this whole complicated society where growing food and preparing it and doing the things at home would be done by women. In fact, all the, all the more difficult things have been done by women. Men have a certain role. This very complex society, now the whole thing's breaking apart. 
but you kill animals. And here's the thing, how this works, these tribes became dependent. That's supposed to be the Earl. I don't know why I made the Earl like that. They became dependent. Pretty soon they needed it. Because how long would it take for them to uh, forget the skills they have? How long does it take? Say it again. Yeah, one generation is gone. Once you don't teach it, it's all gone. And now they're dependent. I mean, there's so many things I had to know that you have no idea. Because their skills have changed. Same thing, well, so many things my parents knew that I didn't have to know. And so, but we think you know and that go on. I think that's part of the reason why you get the my age things were tough. Because they had to know their own separate set of little cultural and economic things. That, and you guys know different things. So that's what happened. And what happens to the beaver? They're really good at killing. And they're gone. And what would that do? To the European point of view, and you'll see this all throughout, but the European point of view, so European point of view, land ownership equals what? What do you have to do on the land? Farm it. To the European point of view, land ownership equals farming. Oh, sure, they'll let them stay on because they're killing beaver we need. But <laughs> Double cop there. After bees are gone, after bees are gone here, <coughs> to the Europeans, what are the tribes that are living here doing? Yeah, taking up good land and wasting it. And here's one of the reasons why this is such a key component. It's more than you can see the dependency and they come take the land. This, since they're not farming anymore, they're just a bunch of uncivilized uh, hunter and gatherers, and they would start using more and more in 100 years, they would it would say savages, which is an important term, because this would, therefore, I'm going to put it up here with like the arrow, like I made that curve. Impressive, huh? This would be a justification to take land. They're just wasting the land, so let's take it. And pretty soon this will become part of the myth of the United States. That there were maybe a few hundred thousand American Indians roaming the plains, uncivilized hunter-gatherers, and this wild land thing could be conquered by settlers from Europe. And that's just garbage. That's not the way it happened. But that's what I was taught when I was in school. I was taught when I was in high school, and you remember, it's junior year, same deal. I know what you're thinking. It's pre-book, pre-building, but... Mr. Lecky, my high school teacher, really liked him, but he said, uh, it, it was really just kind of matter, matter of fact, there were less than one million American Indians on, in what is now the United States when Columbus arrived. And they were wild, and they roamed the plains. I just remember that. You know, it's closer to probably 40 million. But if you say there's less than a million, and they're just, you know, hunter-gatherers, doesn't that make it easier to say, see, we, we took the land from uncivilized hunters and we improved it and made it great. But it's significantly more complex than that. It fits in very well. Remember what, what was a rebellion in 1676? Bacon Rebellion, and that would lead to racism. And doesn't racism justify slavery? Whites are above, so it doesn't make sense to enslave someone below you. Isn't this the same thing? This is a really important idea of this imperialism. And those on the dominant powers don't even sometimes realize it's happening. Because it, this is our culture. Doesn't everybody want to be American? And that's kind of the attitude. Trust me, other countries might have different points of view. So this will come to a head in one of the bloodiest war, at least by the percentage of people killed in American history. The same year, all this would happen in what we call King Philip's War. And this happened along the frontier in Massachusetts along the Connecticut River. And there was a tribe, I'm underlying everything today, the Wampanoags. The Wampanoags were a confederacy of small tribes devastated by disease. For a while, they helped the Puritans and fought the Puritans. By the way, 
Can you read that? Can you imagine it? <coughs> what is this is King Philip's War? We got that right. Massachusetts, Connecticut. All right. W A M P A N. <laughs> Let me write this again. Wapa no odds. But you'll notice that doesn't have as much character as that, right? <laughs> we like a little bit of character, you know. They fought them, but they also uh, they traded with them. And so they were pushed to right here. And the Wampanoags had been fighting all the other tribes. And that's part of the reason why it kind of allowed Massachusetts, or the, sometimes I'll say the Puritans or the English, but move into here. Right into here. Well, by 1670, they had killed most of the beaver on the Connecticut River. And that lush land, you can imagine, Massachusetts wanted it. They claimed it. They're just wasting the land. They moved in. The Wapanoas fought back. But here's the deal. To Europeans, to the English, they could not understand. In fact, it blew their mind the very complex way that most Eastern tribes governed themselves. Plain similar, just a little bit different because they had to move around more because of lack of water. But there was no one person in charge. It was much more democratic. It had to be much more social, much more uh, smiley, democratic, small D, where everybody had a voice, men and women. Women actually, in many ways, probably made the big decisions. Women had significantly more rights than the English did. And that's why so many women fled European colonies and joined the tribes. But, and we'll come back to that again, but the English wanted to deal with one person. A king, or soon they would start saying chief. One man. And since men, their, their main job in this division of labor that tribes had, and their civilization would be men hunted, fought, protected. Women did all the important stuff. And so they looked for that one man who was a warrior. And the leading war of the Wapanoags would be to kind of organize the attack. But remember, this was done by all the men and women basically having to agree this to happen. The English would phonetically spell his name this. Anybody want to try it? Because we're not sure where the accent is. To this day, we're not sure. And I know what I see as an Americanized English speaker. I speak Montana. What do you see? Anybody want to give it a try? I see Metacom. I can't help it. I see Meta Comet. I'm almost positive it wasn't Meta Comet, but that's what I see. <coughs> Do you want to know how the English pronounce his name? Philip. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's where we get Philip. I don't know why, I don't know how that came about, but that's it. And so, the Wapanoag and their allies attacked nearly 70% of the Massachusetts villages. Now think about it. These are tiny little villages, nothing more than maybe one or two houses together. Some are a little bit bigger. So they had this massive attack to drive them back, and they succeeded. They drove them back to Boston. Now, they weren't trying to wipe Boston off, off and if they couldn't have, because that would have been too hard to get. But they pushed the, the Massachusetts colonists back to here. It's a huge victory. And Massachusetts was basically going to surrender. They had a parley where they had a big feast that fall of 1676. And Philip Metacomet came with all the other wars, no weapons. It was basically going to be a treaty, even though they weren't sure what the treaty meant. And liberally gave the uh, Wapadogs rum and food and then what? They had hundreds of militia hidden in the trees around the clearing. <laughs> Especially when they started getting a little bit darker and they started getting a little bit drunk, they attacked them and wiped them all out. Wait, who did that? The English. Yeah. So all their, you know, they met all their leading warriors. You know, people have different functions and they're the leading wars. Killed them all. And then they did a series of surprise attacks on Wapping the Long villages, burning them down and killing them. Okay. Who won? Yeah, they won, didn't they? As they saw, we were supposed to win, right? And so that's how they won. That would become a template for wars all the way. Surprise attacks at night, 
of, of villages of the various tribes, all the way to the plains, all the way to Montana, round them up, basically until they surrender. And that's the way it would be until 1690. That's say 1690, I meant 1890. That's the that would be the method the English would use and then the United States would use. Usually involving alcohol too. But King Philip's war. And so a horribly bloody war. But think about this is a big one of the biggest because it's by percentage of people the bloodiest war in US history. But that happened all along the frontier. And happening small or something even that big, time after time after time. That basic template. And so that would lead to remember I told you about the French having a little better relations? Soon the English running up into French. But more importantly, American Indians trying to defend their land, and they're more allied to the French because there's mobs of these people coming. And so we're going to have all these wars on the frontier. So tomorrow I'll tell you a little bit more about one, and the Revolutionary War was this too. The Revolutionary War also had the same type of fight. <coughs> a whole series of wars, and that are going to be worldwide for empire. The first ones will start in Europe and then go to the colonies, go to India, go to Africa. South Africa was a big area. And North Africa, also along the Asia, or Asian coast. Well, these wars for empire, I'll give you the colonial name. I'm just going to go through them real fast. Big, oh, I should add. Like World War I, World War II, they would get the name by end of World War I called Total War. These are fights for the very existence of a country, not these wars. These are wars were just countries using relatively small, for the most part, professional volunteer soldiers just trying to conquer land, just get little tidbits of land. It wouldn't be to the French Revolution if you see a war that really was that kind of war. And the American Civil War and wars like that, which are the most terrifying types of wars. The first one, 1689 to 1697. So you notice a few years after King Philip's War, the colonies are starting to solidify, starting to get a unique colony. In the colonies, they called it King William's War. I'm talking about the English colonies. In Europe, it was the War of the League of Augsburg. Sometimes called the War of the Third Coalition. That all kind of things. But, yeah. Did they make the slaves fight in wars? For the most part, no, because if you allow slaves to fight, <coughs> that means what are they fighting for? And then if you admit that they can fight for freedom, then why aren't they free now? So, but for example, the British would eagerly recruit colonial slaves in the Revolutionary War and promise them the freedom. Eagerly recruit them. And the US would blame them for the slave rebellions. So, King William's War. It's called the War of Nigel Oxburg. It's fought along the Rhine River. And what happened was this. So, I mentioned that before, and you read about back in 1649, King Charles I was beheaded and went to a republic. The monarchy was reestablished. But there were that the, the second king after this is called the Restoration by the Catholic. And by getting involved with allied with France, with France. So, there was a, they called it the Glorious Revolution, even though there was some fighting. And Parliament found a Protestant monarch, a distant relative who was Protestant. Today, the monarch of mainland must be Protestant, period. They don't have a constitution, but that's one of the laws that still exists from 1689. Well, a distant cousin of the royal family had just married the king of the Netherlands. Her name was William, and I'm sorry, did I say her name was William? Yeah. Her name was Mary. And she married the king of the Netherlands, William. The Netherlands was fighting the French, so guess who now Britain is fighting? So, this war would turn out to be a draw. But the thing was, they're expensive. They're really expensive. Next! Oh, what's the number one job of a monarch, especially at this time? To have an heir. To have a child. William and Mary did not child. So they found a sister of Mary, and the war next war would be named after her. You notice how quick it was? 
And they call this, after her, Queen Anne's War. In Europe, it started as the War of the Spanish Secession. And a couple of things about this. This war was basically a draw on the colonies, but would be a huge British victory. And the French would want revenge. But it was another draw. In fact, the term would be, have you ever heard the term the status quo or status quo? They actually called it status quo after the war or before the war. So it went back to the way it was before the war. It didn't change anything in the colonies, but it still costs money. And there's a lot more col British colonists than English colonists. Now, the next war, 1637, 1737, I'm sorry, to about 1739, it's unclear. Everybody's favorite ear-related war, the War of Jenkins' Ear. And the War of Jenkins' Ear was mostly between the Spanish and the British, but also the French were involved. And as all of you know, you don't mess with ears. They have long memories, and they always they always remember, and they want revenge. We know that, right? Some people are looking at me like, what the hell are you talking about? What year am I talking about? Jenkins was a privateer and a smuggler and also part of the Royal Navy. He was Robert Jenkins on a ship called the Rebecca. And you know what a pirate is? You know what a privateer is? And so he had a contract with the British government. And by then, Spain was weak. But if they're weak, aren't they using beckons? And what they would do is they would sock Spanish gallons, undermine them, and they also wanted what's going to become Georgia to take out in Spain. So there's some conflicts. And they were actually, the British wanted a war. Well, back in 16, or sorry, 1732, Robert Jenkins on the Rebecca, his ship, they were doing a little freelance pirating for the crown. And they saw a lone Spanish galleon. In fact, this happened a number of times, right off of Cuba. What a great place to patrol. And they had a Union Jack. See the Union Jack right there? Now, you see the red diagonal cross? That wasn't there yet. But there, all the rest of us, that was the way the Union Jack looked then. And that's an ensign. The flag, a naval flag is called an ensign. They have that flag. Well, when you see a Spanish ship all alone, it's like easy picking, they bring that flag down. And what flag do they bring up? <coughs> a Spanish flag. We're your friends. And so they sail closer. And remember, these are sailing vessels. They can't run away once you're close. And then they take that flag down when they know they can't run away and put up what flag? A pirate, a black flag. And you see the black flag with a skull and crossbones? Yeah, they have those. But usually just a black flag than pirates. And they would take everything on board the ship, the captain would get half the crew, but the other half. Pretty. Still a lot of money. Well, right after the Rebecca did this, a few days later, they were jumped by three Spanish naval vessels looking for them. They couldn't quite prove, even though they're pretty sure that they're pirates. So what the Spanish did is they captured the Rebecca, roughed up the crew, took almost everything on board, and then as a last little reminder of what they do to pirates, they were scared to hang him, so what did they do to Jenkins? Gone. But that year, they would travel the world looking for fame and fortune and eventually get to London. Years were different back then. They were sentient. No, they stuck in a jar of rum. But the rum was only about 20% alcohol. So just imagine what that ear looked like after five years. Think about a gray, yucky, cauliflower looking thing. And when Spain was, or Britain was looking for an excuse to fight the Spanish over some trade and a few other issues, they brought this ear to Parliament and they took the ear out of the jar and said, look what those diabolical Spaniards did to good, honest English sailmen or sailors. We cannot allow that. And they passed the ear around and they're like, look at this ear. And yes, the ear is still there in a jar in a hallway outside of Parliament. And if you walk, if you go take a tour of Parliament and then it's just all saying, this happened to me. I'm kind of standing there in line, waiting to go, and you go into an observation thing. And I'm standing there, I can look over, Ugh. <laughs> and there's this gray thing in a jar, Jenkins ear. And I took it home. You want to actually they don't allow the garments in Parliament. They just don't allow it. And so I saw the ear, I thought, oh my god, I get a picture of the ear. And so I did one of the 
you know, kind of looked around and I took my camera out. This is a while ago, this one, 12 years ago. Took my camera out and <laughs> just started to bring it up. And out of nowhere, there's a hand on my shoulder. And one of the guards who was in a medieval dress, <laughs> it's actually kind of surreal, and he just goes, so I didn't answer. And I was sent to jail. That's <laughs> five years in the Tower of one. But it's actually so funny, you just look at me like, you dumb yank. Okay, so <laughs> this war would too be a draw. Shall we have another war? 1741. To 1748. In the colonies, the war, or I'm sorry, not the war, King George's War. Is that starting to sound familiar? Queen Anne didn't have an heir. <coughs> Poor Queen Anne literally lost her mind trying to have an heir. She'd be pregnant 17 times. Almost all of them would be stillborn. And if you know anything about pregnancy back then, one out of three women died in childbirth. And the loss, the pain she went through drove her literally mad. In fact, a movie about that was nominated for Academy Award, and the actress who played Queen Anne won the Best Actress Award last year, called The Favorite. And it's a, it's, I like it, but it's wild. It's really wild. Wow, is it wild? And it's rated off. So you want to watch it, you have to get See, I did. I, yeah. Okay. But, um, I'm old. I'm over 17, so I can watch it. And so, no heir, they had to find a distant relative who wasn't Catholic. So there's a little tiny principality, like a little kingdom in Britain, in, what is now Germany, called Hanover. And there's a king of Hanover there, a little tiny place. He was a cousin and Protestant. So they asked King George, would you like to be king? And sure, even though he refused to learn English, his son, King George II, there refused to learn English. So they're Germans who are the monarchs of England then. The Hanoverian dynasty, same thing would happen. They'd be replaced by the Saxe Colberts, who were Germans. And that's the current modern, uh, royal family. And they're German, so they German roots, kings of England. And one more thing we should add, probably part of the reason why Queen Anne, you know, probably that children, remember these are royal families. So these are all looking for other people's royal blood. So we have all these cousins, married cousins, right? And that's probably what happened to them. And so all these horse-based people couldn't have children. And therefore, another rule. Remember I told you cannibalism is bad, right? Don't snort tobacco. And don't marry your cousin. <laughs> she might want to say sure. So with that, the thing is, this war, King George's, the French lost in the colonies. Colonial, what do you call every village, every place had to have regular people would have to train, not only to protect themselves from attack, but also slave rebellion. What do you call those informal soldiers or farmers or whatever they might be, but then they trained to be a soldier? Militia. Colonial militia actually won big victories. The militia. And the French nearly lost. But when the treaty was ratified, ending this war, it went back to the old borders. But the French are now scared. Think about the French point of view. We're out number 10 to 1. We barely came out of this. If there's another war, we might lose New France. They also had islands in the Caribbean. Most important of them would be Santa Domingo, which he sugar. And they might lose the whole thing. France is really getting worried because English colonists are outnumbering them. And so they're actually looking for a way for a, almost a preemptive strike. At the same time, the English colonists had arrived at the Appalachian Mountains and at first looking for beaver, they started going over. Almost all the colonists claimed this land. Almost all the colonies, Virginia, Maryland, New, uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, they all claimed it. But you know who else claimed it? I know this sounds weird. Individual colonies, like Virginia colony, but also Great Britain. Back in London, they claimed it, perhaps to make another colony. And the French claimed it. And what about the people who are 
and it's going to be a race starting with the fur trade, but this fits in with imperialism and also colonial economies, the Ohio River Valley. Fur was at first, but then land. And think about those plantation owners in Virginia. Yeah, they're the wealthiest plant or wealthiest colony, but it's being used up by tobacco cultivation. And you know, think about it. the kids and uh, the kids of plantation owners. Have, plantations are literally dying, <coughs> and they're going to inherit this, or be the second son inherit that. There's a real thirst for land, but there's something else going on. There's not a lot of money in the colonies. Just imagine if you're there first to an area that people want, this incredibly valuable piece of real estate. What if you're there first? You stake a big claim once you get rid of I don't care about who lives there. What's going to happen to the value of that land once other people start coming? Other people come and they want that land. Push the price up. If they can get it while it's still cheap and sell it for a profit, well, isn't that nice? Isn't that the dream of almost everybody? Or there's so many people to get rich without actually working? You buy something, buy something that's relatively cheap and then wait and sell it at a profit. And there's a name for this. It's called speculation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, not just think about all the British colonies and British and the French. They all want to do it. Speculation. So there's speculators. And this is a gamble. Aren't you kind of rolling to die, hoping to buy and the price goes up? And sometimes they can push the price really high and create what they call artificially high prices or a bubble. We will obviously talk about this more later because there's going to be a lot of speculative bubbles and almost everyone will destroy the, the U.S. economy. You live through the second biggest in history. The real estate bubble of 2004 to 2007, when people realized they're overpaying for land and prices tumbled, the worldwide economy lost somewhere between 50 and 70 trillion dollars of wealth they thought they had and destroyed the entire world's economy. And we're still, the effects of it are there. The recovery from that began about 2012, and we're still in it. Now the economy is starting to fade, go down. Now, I don't see a bubble coming, but a bubble will form again, an employee economy up again. Just now you guys go to college. Don't lurk. I'm not lurking. It's technically time for me to be here. Huh? 125. That's what Because you own the socks. Are you supposed to see all the socks? Oh, yeah, leave. <laughs> the socks. <and> okay. <laughs> oh. Who was one for this? That was lame. I could have, I could have a pitchfork in my back. One more time. Assassin. There we go. Now, we'll talk about low energy. But what Virginian thought he could get there first and get rich? George Washington. And that's how George Washington would start the French Indian War that would lead to American independence. He planned it all to make himself the first president. He had this long plan. What? Let's get into wrong. I thought you were talking about George Clooney. George Clooney? What do we have to do? Oh, now we have to go to Vietnam. Okay, good answer. All right, come here. Come here, back. Come here, back. Don't need to come here, too. Everyone get right in front of the camera. We'll get you right in there. Why? Come on, family shot. Come on, right in front of the camera right there. Why? Let's get everyone. Come on, get in front of the camera. Everyone's face. Let's go. Come on. Get right in there. Let's go. Let's see something. Let's go. See? Come on, get, get your mug right up there. 
Get right there. Get right here. Right here. <laughs> what, is, what is it doing? You're going, you're being broadcast across the world. Are you famous? <laughs> All right. We ended it.